have um, a pre-session. This is a little bit different than usual, and it's a kind of a special treat. Um, we're going to be able to get a little look into the future and to hear about a project that's going on here at Case and in the Cleveland community um, that's getting some attention. Um, and uh, we're calling this session Fiber to the Home. Um, Lev Gonick, who I would be very surprised if anyone is in this room does not know Lev, but uh, he will be leading the discussion. So I think without further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to you, Lev. Thanks, Wendy. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being up uh, bright and early this morning and hopefully surviving the uh, experience of our first spring thunderstorm uh, through the night. Great to have everybody here this morning, and um, thanks for making it to our, our early uh, first session. I want to uh, just frame uh, the conversation today and introduce my friends and colleagues who are up here. Uh, to my immediate left is Russell Soji. Russell is actually in charge of the business development program at Google for their access team, which is working on the gigabit fiber to the home initiative that Google announced recently. And to his left is Scott Rourke, the CEO and president of One Community, Northeast Ohio's community broadband provider. And uh, what we'd like to do is, uh, Russell's in town to spend some time with the One Community uh, team today, and so uh, we're thrilled that he's going to kick his early, early morning for him at 5 a.m. Uh, West Coast time uh, with, us, uh, with us here and uh, give folks uh, a little bit of a context, as Wendy indicated, on uh, some work that we've been doing here at the university and um, put it into some context for the kind of work that Scott does every day to give people a bit of an update and a framing of the work that uh, one community has been doing and also to provide a, a, a national context for the kind of work that Russell and his colleagues are working with. And so without any further ado, I just want to ask uh, that Dwayne uh, roll a little bit of video and we'll continue the conversation right after that. Case Western Reserve University, founded in 1826, is the university in Cleveland, Ohio's University Circle, a unique collection of over 40 cultural, health, and education institutions. Case Western Reserve University has a tradition of science and technology innovation that includes its share of Nobel laureates and internet innovations like the ARPANET, Cleveland Freenet, and more recently, the vision of leveraging advanced information technology through one community to address community priorities. One Community was started in 2004 by Case Western Reserve University and the City of Cleveland with support from Nortec. One Community now connects more than 150 organizations and more than 1,800 facilities in Northeast Ohio with unprecedented gigabit speeds. In 2009, Case Western Reserve University began a new research program focused on connecting neighborhoods with gigabit connectivity. The goal was to assess the impact these ultra-broadband speeds would have on people's lives. The first community to become part of the research program is Hessler Street, a historic heritage neighborhood with 104 homes and located in the heart of the university. Because there's real data streams coming in, they can help solve real life problems. In order to test, validate, and experiment, the university has also opened up a public alpha house, which is a demonstration home that the public can visit and explore. What I thought we would do is maybe just go over to uh, the alpha house. Good morning to everyone over at uh, Botanical Gardens, as well as everyone who's uh, viewing over the internet. This spring, the university hosted a demonstration day called the Gigabit Breakfast Club to share some initial experimentation. The innovation efforts at Case Western Reserve University, known as the Case Connection Zone, have garnered national attention. To really celebrate what you all have done, uh, you all are on page 121 of the National Broadband Plan. As we comb through all the different things going on in the country, we recognize that this is a very special initiative. Unlike other broadband initiatives, the Case Connection Zone focuses on supporting the development of compelling services in health, education, safety, and energy management that will drive adoption and demand. The Case Connection Zone is focused on next-generation services that help imagine and influence the future. Have you checked your cholesterol recently? Yes, and I'm now taking 10 milligram 
new ways of home health and wellness education. We drill the hole through the bone, and then we have a, a probe that gently enters into the ventricular system. New ways of thinking about education in science technology and engineering and math. Right now, we've got three different lab stations set up in this laboratory. How well does high school chemistry prepare students for college chemistry? When I left high school, I thought I knew a lot about chemistry and came to college and <laughs> learned that was very wrong. New interactive engagement with peers and professors. You're going to have applications in your neighborhood where your neighborhood is going to be safer. You're going to have cameras strategically planted. New ways of thinking about neighborhood security. All this wireless stuff needs power. New ways of educating people about energy management. Case Western Reserve University's research program is at once advancing the research lab of a great university well beyond its physical walls and at the same time engaging in meaningful community partnerships that address priorities defined by the communities around us here in Cleveland, Ohio. Great. Um, so I thought we would uh, start by just uh, asking uh, Russell to uh, share a little bit about the work that he and his colleagues from the Google Access team um, have been working on. Again, just for those of you who walked in, um, Russell Soji is responsible for business development for the Google Access team for the well-publicized Google Fiber to the Home initiative. And um, I thought it'd be helpful, maybe, Russell, if you could just sort of start by sort of level setting. And what is the Google Fiber to the Home uh, program that, I, again, I think probably many of us know about, but let's get us all on the same page. And then you know, what are some of your preliminary insights in terms of the business development opportunities? Sure. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on the whole program. Some of this will probably be repeat for a lot of you, but uh, hopefully some of, it's, some of it's new to most of you too, as well. Um, earlier this year, we, uh, Google announced uh, a program we're calling Google Fiber for Communities. Uh, the effort is going to be, we're going to be building on a fiber network. Uh, the fiber network will be delivering one gigabit per second speeds. Um, aside from one community, that's uh, speeds that are generally about 100 times faster than you'd find in most broadband networks. Um, what you guys have done here is great, uh, but we'd like to see that rolled out in a lot of other areas as well. Um, the other commitment that we've made is that it'll, it will serve between 50 and 500,000 users, uh, and that'll be in one or possibly more than one cities as, as, as we build out. Um, the, the main question that we get from a lot of folks is, why, why is Google doing this? Um, the, the main reason we're doing this is it's, it's con a continuation of, like Lev said, our access uh, program. Uh, we're very interested in getting uh, people a, a better access to the internet. Um, it's, it's an ongoing effort that we have. Uh, we've, we've done work in the Wi-Fi for Communities effort. We've done work in the broadband spectrum space, and this is sort of a continuation of those efforts. Um, the other thing that we're really trying to get out of this is uh, spurring innovation and experimentation in uh, accessing ultra-high-speed networks. Um, there are three major areas that we're trying to, trying to do, trying to find the innovation and experimentation. First is in the construction, the actual uh, build out of the network. Uh, the second is in uh, innovative and new uh, open access uh, programs. Uh, we've committed to the network being open access, uh, so we expect to see uh, many service providers on the network. Uh, and then the third area is actually the applications themselves. Uh, we're really excited about the new applications that a gigabit per second can, uh, can enable. Uh, and we're really looking forward to those kinds of uh, things. Uh, just as important as sort of what we're not doing. Uh, there's, there's a couple things that we're not doing. Um, we're not committing to build out a national ISP. I think a lot of people are thinking that we're doing those kinds of, that kind of an effort. Uh, we're not going to become a TV provider. We're not going to be a telephone, a telephone company. Um, the other, other things, I think there's some rumors around the fact that we'll be you know, delivering free access to everybody. We're not going to be doing that. Uh, we're trying to build a real business here. Um, and we're not looking for funding from the government or city that we're actually building out. Um, so that's kind of just to give you a quick background on this. So part. Russell, one of those three elements that you spoke about was open access. Mm -hmm. And maybe Scott, we can ask you to kind of jump in at this point because for the last seven years, uh, one community has been building out a, a very large regional open access network which invites other providers to, to be partners. And Maybe you can also level set for us kind of what the journey has been like these last several years as you've expanded from what was obviously a kind of Cleveland-centered effort to what is now 22 counties and maybe more 
um, as we speak mm -hmm. and speak to this whole issue of, of this very interesting model that now Google has picked up on and I think a lot of us across the country are very interested in, which is the commitment to open access. And what does that do to actually engage other providers? Uh, sure, thanks, Lev. I, I guess one key level setting point uh, for those that uh, haven't studied this industry, and I don't blame you at all for doing so, but the United States, I guess, to level set is not competitive with other industrialized nations. Um, we're generally, to oversimplify it, we're the highest cost and the lowest speeds versus uh, what you might consider our biggest industrial competitors. So uh, really what we've done is, in, in the United States, we have some, some really interesting uh, models uh, as we deregulate from the monopoly, the fo what was originally the phone, phone monopolies, um, we really struggled as the knowledge economy became more important and the internet came more, became more important as a country moving from the phone company monopolies into a very competitive internet-based economy. So really what we've done here is we, uh, it, the, the financial barriers are huge in the United States to build it out. There's actually, because there is no competition, the return on investment expectations from these big public companies is really high. So our availability isn't very good out in the rural markets. Um, the costs, again, are, are very high. There's no competition. Speeds are low. And it's really inhibiting innovation. So, so really what we're talking about here is the competitive of the United States in general. And, and our poor infrastructure, digital infrastructure, is a competitive disadvantage. And it's hurting not just our productivity, but our innovation. So I guess with that level playing field there, or, or setting the, the tone there, what we've been trying to do, and actually both of us are, <clears throat> are trying to do is disrupt the current models. Uh, there's not much competition. The United States does not have a, uh, is not implementing a lot of policies, a lot of incentives in broadband that's very unique. So we've, we're both innovating and trying to catalyze uh, both the supply side of the, uh, of the issue and the demand side. So as it relates to one community's approach, uh, we work on the demand side as much as the supply side. We, we are a provider of internet services, as, as you saw, to well over 1,000 institutions. But we also work on the demand side, educating people on why you should uh, come on this journey, why you should learn, why you should get skills, why you should use applications and the likes. Um, the costs still are a barrier for us. <clears throat> so what we've done is, from open access perspective, we build out this big infrastructure, and then we actually uniquely share it. Uh, again, historically, the phone and the cable companies don't like to share their assets. They like to rent uh, as much as they can and own and control. So we've got this open access. We're a nonprofit, and we share our infrastructure with other providers, with other institutions, and it's a very disruptive model because it collapses the costs and it has big, big capabilities, enabling really cool uses and applications, enabling innovation. So from our model, I guess, to, to be more concrete, uh, for Cuyahoga County, <clears throat> they wanted to redo their, their telecom, 61 sites throughout Cuyahoga County. This is government, public safety network. We actually partnered, and this is not a common uh, phrase in the industry, we partnered with two cable companies one phone company, we used Cases Fiber, we used uh, Metro Health Fiber, and we saved them $10 million versus the number two bid by, because we actually shared in an open way um, the, what we consider our community assets, but they're public and private assets. So very disruptive, very unique model. And again, the key is that uniquely we're open, that's kind of a new phrase, and that's, we see it as a community asset, public or private, and we want everybody to share and we try and collapse costs because we see the social benefit very different than the incumbent folks that are trying to get money mostly for entertainment um, uh, and really high short-term returns, not thinking about the social implications um, uh, of, which is for us the real driver here is, is improving the competitiveness of the United States. So Scott, would you just say another word? So as, as one community continues to build out this open access network and inviting other providers to get engaged, I know one of the areas that uh, you've been working on for the last couple of years is a rural health care program. And maybe you can just sort of say a little bit about kind of the rural health care program as an interesting program that the, that the audience might be interested in, but in particular the sort of question of who else in the provider community. Obviously, if you are for the first time ever reaching out into communities that heretofore really have had only chicken wire to connect, are there other providers that are interested in coming along the journey as you put down conduit and, and, and begin to light up the, I presume, the healthcare anchors in those, in, in those communities? Yes, the, from a provider perspective, uh, I guess another part of our open access is, uh, I guess the best example is out in the rural communities. So our, our vision is, uh, and again, our, we're looking for consumers to actually realize the benefits and, and industry to realize the benefits. So, so again, very different. We look all the way down the chain on what are the gaps you know, we, we see this as economic development. What are the gaps uh, from a skills and other resources perspective? 
So with other partners in the rural communities, we're actually building two hospitals, uh, building the big healthcare network. We're, we're one of the largest in the country, and we are doing 40 gigabit speeds to enable sharing of like medical imaging and e-prescriptions and all sorts of fascinating shared services. But in the rural communities, what we're doing is we're building the hospitals, and then we're, we're opening up our infrastructure, and we're asking local phone and cable companies, we're offering to them to actually leverage all our infrastructure. So think of it as we go into a rural community that does not have fiber optics, um, we will open up this outpost. You know, we've got the super highway that we bring to a rural community, like in Coshocton, as an example, which is a couple counties south of us. There's not a lot of business models out there because the density is so poor. So we actually were able to get uh, public funding, um, some private investment as well, and go out and build to a hospital, and then we open it up to a provider there, a phone or a cable company as an example, and say, use this great stuff, we'll, we'll collapse your costs, and then we help them attract the money and the skills to actually build out, say, a fiber to the home, to the community, in a rural community that really had no hope of getting connected to the internet for, say, 10 or so years. So, uh, I, I don't know, Russell, just on this sort of theme of, of providers, I mean, Scott sort of shared the story of, of uh, you know, one community, this uh, nonprofit provider essentially provides the big pipe out to the neighborhood, and finds an anchor institution, and then opens it up. I know a couple of weeks ago, uh, Google made a similar kind of announcement with respect to uh, their interest in partnering on the issue of providers, and sort of said, you know, we're going to obviously, as you uh, shared, uh, build out this infrastructure connected to your your um, into your backhaul to to your fiber optic infrastructure across the country. Um, have you received some sort of uh, area of sort of expressions of interest when it comes to other providers exploring ways of leveraging what you're doing, or is that just sort of an initial trial balloon that you've set out there for the time so, being? So I think um, it's really early to sort of say what the provider uh, landscape is going to look like. Uh, we've had discussions with many different providers for many different kinds of services, um, as well as communities, um, as well as folks like Scott and, and folks. Um, but I think it's a little early to say sort of exactly what the partnership models are going to look like. Um, but we are excited, and, and there is definitely interest in terms of uh, other providers offering services on the network. It'll, it'll be uh, really interesting, though, to see. And clearly, as Scott framed it, I mean, certainly a potentially fairly disruptive uh, um, opportunity. On the one hand, uh, inviting providers to go places that on their own they wouldn't necessarily go. But uh, on the other hand, it doesn't sound like, it's certainly from Scott's experience, like there's a lot of kicking and screaming when the opportunity is provided. Uh, local uh, providers and, and, and interests seem to coalesce around that opportunity. And, and I presume it's not only out of uh, community uh, uh, sort of uh, philanthropy. It's rather, they, I think they probably see that there's a business model there. Um, maybe we could sort of just sort of, uh, sort of switch. I'm going to use Russell's framing of these three areas that Google has sort of picked up on. And, and, and in just a little bit, we'll open the floor to the audience for if you want to explore the provider issue. The other two pieces really had to do with uh, um, applications, and, um, and I thought we'd go there next and maybe then finish up with a conversation on Russell's actually first point, which is how do you build this thing um, and, and, and kind of go around that. So maybe one of the things that would be interesting, uh, obviously, uh, when you build out a, a gigabit network, when you build out anything today that is so big <laughs> that it, ex that it, it uh, really... Uh, creates a huge challenge for the imagination for what you would do with stuff that today you actually can't consume because there's no actual service that actually consumes a gigabit, a thousand megabits per second um, in one framework. And we've obviously created an incredibly uh, ex a provocative set of applications uh, based on algorithms to compress um, requirements because we actually have constrained bandwidth. And so the challenge is to begin to think about the applications that will take advantage of ultra broadband uh, connectivity. And, and uh, I think, Scott, one of the interesting things that we've found, I serve on Scott's board as, as the Case Western Reserve University representative. One of the things that I think uh, we found early on uh, was that we thought that municipal services and, and university and education services might be some of the killer apps. But I, I'd invite you to share with, um, with uh, me and with the audience uh, some of the extraordinary work that's been going on in the healthcare space, because when we look at least at, at who's gulping all of this bandwidth, uh, we very quickly find out that as big as we think in education that we're the large consumers, uh, we're dwarfed by what you and your colleagues have built out with the, education, with the healthcare community. Yeah, from a, a healthcare perspective, they're very interested in how they use it now, and, and I think how the vision of how they're going to use it. Uh, from a, we are building 40 gigabit connections now. We connect about 100 hospitals, probably any healthcare system you could mention throughout the whole Northeast Ohio region. 
what we're seeing with them is, uh, first it started out with really medical imaging. They started sharing like MRIs from within the, the, their affiliates uh, and, and their sister sites, their sister hospitals. Now we're seeing a lot more collaboration. So now we're actually seeing in Cleveland here as an example, a lot of collaborations between our county health system called Metro Health, University Hospitals, and the Cleveland Clinic. Um, we recently have been working on electronic medical records and actually um, uh, with cases as well as uh, particularly the medical school, we're doing a, a lot of work on electronic medical records, uh, shared services, which is where we'd have a common platform for let's say e-prescriptions, which improve the quality of healthcare, reduce errors, um, reduce costs. Uh, we've been able to attract a lot of financial resources, so we've actually are all the way down to the free clinics now. So the, whether it's the free, uh, the, they're called safety net hospitals. So we've attracted millions of dollars to actually help get them electronic medical records, and then we try and make them interoperable with the other systems. So as an example, an uninsured person that would go from emergency room to emergency room, let's say from Metro Health to UH, we would know, everybody would know that they were allergic to penicillin without having to give it to them again and again and again. So there's all sorts of fascinating uh, models. I think we're certainly one of the leaders in the country in doing, uh, we've got telehealth that's coming online now where we're actually doing in rural areas, we're actually bringing like a Cleveland Clinic doctor or, or somebody from Case, we're bringing them into the rural communities and, and actually with a nursing assistant down there, we're able to give them high like specialty care, let's say cardiology from the clinic as an example. So we're starting to bring these out and, and take advantage of Cleveland's greatest skills and some of Akron's greatest skills and we're extending those into the rural communities, uh, particularly in the healthcare, and those are all enabled solely by fiber optics. One of the things that I know that, you know, I, I guess maybe Russell, I can, I can sort of um, ask you as you and your colleagues, uh, and maybe you can sort of just share with the audience the, the extent to which when you guys put out this call for expressions of interest, um, you know, what kind of feedback you got from uh, people across the country. Um, obviously, you've begin, begun to cull through those expressions of interest, and uh, no doubt you're looking for um, killer apps that are somehow in there. Maybe you uh, can sort of share uh, either from the community pr uh, providing of the killer, killer apps or from your own interest in the business development opportunities. Um, obviously, we've got a healthcare kind of play. Other things that you're seeing that, that are interesting in the killer app space? Yeah. First of all, you said sort of what kind of reaction have we gotten to the, to the, uh, to the request for information. Um, it's actually been overwhelming. It's, it's really um, been spectacular. The, uh, we put out the RFI, I think, earlier this year, and I think it closed uh, probably about a month ago now. Um, there were 1,100, over 1,100 uh, cities, communities, groups of communities that, that, that actually responded to the RFI. It's, it's been really impressive. And there were thousands and thousands of individuals that responded and said that they were interested in, in, in getting higher speed uh, broadband. Um, so that was really encouraging and kind of surprising to us in terms of the enthusiasm that people really showed. Um, in terms of the applications, I think this is, um, you know, Scott was talking about sort of the, um, the healthcare uh, usage. Um, I think clearly anchor institutions are going to be key to building out the network. Um, it's one of the areas that we're most interested in, in trying to explore further, though, the applications that the individuals and the households will be using. Uh, we talked about before, we're not going to be offering this network for free to individual, individuals, so we're going to have, have to offer them some additional value to the current broadband they're receiving today. Um, the question is, what is the killer app that's going to be using a gigabit per second? I think that's an unknown at this point. Um, I think if you look back to before, before you had internet, would you have ever dreamt of all the applications that you used dial-up for? Probably not. Before you had broadband, would you have dreamt of like YouTube or something like that existing? And I think those are um, a lot of the unknowns that, that I, I think there's a lot of really incredible applications that individuals will be using that we don't even know exist today. I think uh, there are some applications out there that, um, that are aching for more broad broadband. I think video is, is a key one to that. Uh, but I think a lot of the applications we have yet to, to, to find out what they are. So I'll just sort of add, I mean, again, one of the things that we've been working with One Community and some of the One Community partners on, on our pilot program in the Case Connection Zone are to begin to explore, and if, as you just mentioned, Russell, they turned out to be, in, in fact, almost all of them video, intensively video-based. and so. Uh, we, we've done a, a series of pilot projects with the home health uh, initiatives trying to extend the model that Scott indicated for a community, a rural community, uh, being connected to an uh, anchor healthcare institution. What happens if you take it beyond the, the community uh, healthcare setting and take it right to the home? And so we've done some, if you will, health presence kind of, of uh, demonstration activities. And certainly uh, there's a lot of interest in different models with using sensors inside homes. So there's this whole idea of creating 
um, a healthy home that communicates in real time not only how people are uh, doing in the home in terms of their health vitals, but also how well the actual uh, home health is in terms of environmental health and having that uh, certainly be communicating in real time. There's certainly been also quite a bit of interest as in the education community uh, and taking a look on how to create peer-to-peer -peer as well as mentoring, as well as other creative ways of, of educating uh, people in the community. We, we, in this inner city area, all around us here at the university have um, an at-risk community in many, many ways. One of them is, in fact, education completion, uh, which is less than 40% of the kids entering ninth grade finish high school. And so uh, we certainly have a, a commitment to try to figure out how we can use this network, not only from the university, but working with our museum partners and, and uh, library partners and others to try to figure that out. Um, Scott, you want to sort of jump in on some other kind of a a applications in that kind of space? Yeah, I, I think... Uh we, we were fortunate to be the guest of the mayor of Seoul, and, and if you don't know, uh, South Korea in particular is probably number one in the world in broadband. They've got actually fiber to the home, they just broke over 50%, but essentially 100% have uh, 100 megabit or better services, and uh, they're moving up, uh, they're investing again and, and moving everybody to a gigabit. So I went there fascinated about this great infrastructure, and they think they're not very good at the application layer, but I was fascinated about the story um, they really see it as uh, their competitive advantage is digital infrastructure, wired and wireless. So there's, they call it ubiquitous, and it is everywhere. They do have WiMAX and Wi-Fi and all sorts of proprietary technologies all layered on top of their fiber. And, and I was most struck by, uh, as you mentioned, e-learning. I went to the equivalent of a Shaker Heights, a small affluent uh, part of Seoul, and they had in one room a student running a camera, not unlike you would see at a case, one teacher in front of the board, and. 600,000 kids, this is at 6 p.m. at night, their time, uh, 600,000 kids logged on to the equivalent of a Shaker Heights community, and they opened it up to the whole place uh, with no grades, just learning, whatever it was, and then they store it, and it's open, open source, for free, this big library, all the kids, they wanna learn whatever they wanna learn, they have this huge glossary, like one site you can go in, and, and with a great search, I, I don't recall that it was a Google search, but a great search engine, to find all this, this treasure trove of stuff, and common curriculums, um, high quality. So that was fascinating. Uh, from an e-government perspective, I was surprised. For, uh, with no computer from your any TV in this community, this large community, um, they had 300 government services from your couch, just with a remote control and with your TV. So that was fascinating, 300, so you actually can print with watermarking all the documents you need for your personal and business uses. All your building permits, all remotely with no human intervention, and the process went from months to days, you know, hours or days. It was fascinating to watch. Those were probably the two, uh, uh, healthcare, they had some other examples, but those were the two most profound ones. And these are folks that don't think they're good at the application layer, they're just building because they've got a tech industry, tech jobs, and they know that this is the future. So they kind of have strong leadership and strong public policy and incentives to encourage the building of it because like, like Russell mentioned, this is electricity. We don't know what's gonna come next. We just got it. I used to be able to light my you know, light up my house, whether it was a lantern or what have you, we didn't know what electricity at one point was gonna be good for. We're kind of at that stage and, and you've got fiber, what is that going to bring? That's really the stage we're at now, I feel. Russ, do you wanna add anything? Or I was just gonna mention another big piece that I know that we're working on, it has to do with energy and energy management and grid and smart grid kinds of activities. And I, I suspect that there's no doubt uh, one or two uh, players in the energy, green energy space. I know Google itself has taken quite a bit of interest in this space. Yeah, we have, we have some efforts in, in that space, uh, smart grid, and we have a, a, an effort we call Power Meter, which is uh, in-home energy management and, and access to that kind of information. Um, so I, I guess I would just sort of second all the areas that, that uh, Scott was talking about, the healthcare, the government, the e-learning, uh, and, and to be quite honest, there'll be an entertainment aspect to it as well. Um, but I think those are all sort of the major areas that, that, are, that are on the near-term horizon anyway. I think the long-term horizon, we don't know what that's going to look like. Well, maybe I can just actually join that first item and the second item together before we go to uh, this, the question of how to build it. So this issue of entertainment and, and open access. So one of the things that we've been fascinated with here is that, of course, what one community has built out, if I try to frame it, is a very, very large campus all across Northeast Ohio in the sense that we all share a kind of private network. It's, it's, it's your network. You've decided to open up the network to providers who want to r jump on it. But unlike the commercial network, as you described it, uh, the sort of uh, public network infrastructure, uh, we can do some things, at least experimentally, that a few people can do. And 
Um, are, are you finding expressions of interest among entertainment providers, con people who've got content um, in the entertainment space, by which I presume Russell was inferring kind of the quote unquote old style television content that are interested in riding your infrastructure to see about new models of, of making that happen? Yeah, I, I would brought in a little bit more than entertainment, but, but we've been fortunate in one community to now have critical mass throughout 22 counties with great anchor accounts, as Lev called them. So we've got hospitals, schools, libraries, and we're hoping local providers of phone and cable will actually continue to invest and, and build out and extend it into the community. From an entertainment perspective, each one of these providers has their own capabilities and services. So we're, we're also trying to prompt economic development. So we're connecting all the data centers. So we started with cases, technology partners. We got fiber to all those. So we continue to plug everybody in, and all those services are available to everybody on the network. So it, it's been a couple years since we heard the phrase network effect, really, but that's what we're building. We're plugging in all the service providers, public and private, and I, I think some of the public institutions are gonna become service providers. I think you're gonna see county government go into services. Um, not necessarily entertainment, but I think they're going to actually share. I think you'll see the people. The of county government and entertainment. Uh, we've got enough entertainment. from. Entertaining, well, that's entertaining enough. <laughs> so, uh, so each one of these providers actually has like uh, an entertainment solution. So we plug all these in. So from a consumer's perspective, you're going to have unbelievable amount of choices on, on the offerings, the quality, and, and perhaps uh, an interesting montage of choices, maybe multiple different providers simultaneously. Imagine if you had the equivalent of a, a cable uh, satellite, uh, all these things, all on demand instantaneously at the same time for, the, for what you're paying today. It'd be fascinating. Great. And so, so the last, again, I'm going to just go back to Russell's framing of it. So he had these three issues that Google has framed that works for us for our morning conversation today. One had to do, obviously, with the killer apps, which we've at least begun to explore. Uh, the second uh, piece, again, that we, we uh, you know, wanted to begin to figure out was you know, different kind of models. Uh, the third piece really has to do with, uh, you know, if you go back to this electricity model, I presume that back in the day, the first way we drew electricity and created the first semblance of a grid for electricity uh, turned out to be very different than the way we went to scale when we actually built out the electric grid as we know it today. So when we sort of look at the analog here, we've got fiber optics that's basically been an industry that's been around for, you know, the north of 30 years or so. Uh, but it's been very much a cottage industry, even though it's obviously hugely impactful at the interstate highway level. And now we've got quite a bit of, as it were, kind of regional, um, you know, highway infrastructure that uses fiber optics. But one of the things that is, of course, fascinating is that if we hit the critical mass of adoption for fiber optic at the kind of speeds that, that Russell is proposing that, that Google experiment with and that Scott is building out around here, we may find very different models of deploying that fiber optic model. And I, again, I know, Russell, one of the things in addition to getting different kind of service providers into the mix, you've also made a call to the broad community of of guys who build this infrastructure to see about getting innovative with um, how to do it, um, perhaps um, technically more interesting, perhaps at a different kind of deployment model, perhaps a different kind of business model. Is there anything that you can share at this point in terms of that? So we're still really early in this process. Um, we're still doing the evaluations of the cities, um, but we have had a lot of conversations with a lot of the current players that are doing build out. Um, we've actually had a brainstorming session with some folks uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, but there isn't a lot to talk about in terms of uh, innovative models at this point. Um, but we are expecting to not only um, you know, ask the community for innovative models, but also we're planning on doing some experiments in terms of the actual build out. I mean, we'll probably implement multiple different kinds of construction methods and, uh, and, and see what works and what doesn't work in, in different communities, in different areas, in different geographies. Um, so I think it's one of the things that we're really looking forward to is being able to experiment with different kind of build-out build out models. Um, but there, it's, it's too early to say sort of what is going to be um, something that's really going to pr you know, provide a real breakthrough opportunity for, for the kind of construction. So Scott, I, I, just a last point to you, and then I'm going to open it up. So folks, if you've got questions and you've been wanting to ask Google directly your questions or ask Scott Rourke from One Community directly, here's your shot at it. Uh, for the last 15 minutes or so. I, I know, Scott, that as you've traveled the world and been invited to talk about what one community has been doing, no doubt um, as, you, as you travel and hear stories about how others are deploying the fiber optic infrastructure, no doubt there are, are interesting models. We've certainly you know, been approached by folks in our little case connection zone on people wanting to put fiber through sewers, uh, people wanting to put fiber through, uh, you know, essentially the uh, electrical distribution um, um, grid. 
uh, along with the traditional um, you know, overbuild, uh, either in the ground or, or aerially connected to poles. Any, any interesting stories or insights or anecdotal? Uh? I would say our, our perspective from an innovation and, and partnership perspective, uh, if I go back to the Korea example, they've actually got a policy where all construction is actually built for telecom and the specs are actually built in so that you actually, at a basement level, everything's pre-wired, pre-configured, they have all the specs, everything's standardized, so it collapses the deployment cost substantially, uh, which is one of the ways they've been able to, in addition to having a pretty dense population and a lot of high rises, uh, they actually, with policy, have been able to do things like construction policies. Whenever you build a highway, you have to put in fiber. Um, in this region, and, and to get to the partnership piece, we've got a couple utility companies, First Energy and Cleveland Public Power as examples. Um, they have varying degrees of interest. They, they do these trenches, and, and it's almost free to actually lay down the fiber. The, the cost isn't the fiber optics itself. It's digging the trenches and dropping it. So, uh, so it's fascinating. We, we have partnerships with both. With First Energy, we're working on some smart grid uh, capabilities. Uh, we've, uh, I know they're experimenting with uh, um, internet over power lines and a variety of things. So there is some innovations. Uh, we're trying to support both. Um, we've been in stimulus requests trying to develop models together. And, uh, and again, we're really not trying to do all the innovation ourselves, but work with partners, bring them together, and find disruptive, innovative ways to collapse the cost and, and most importantly, get big speeds to the consumers and have meaningful use with it. Great. Okay. So that's a, a hopefully an interesting framing of some ways of thinking about uh, perhaps one of the most exciting and uh, provocative um, efforts um, in the national broadband world right now, um, as the little video clip shared. Uh, you know, the national broadband policy is really this country's very first effort to frame a policy uh, for, the, for the country. Uh, the work that goes on is not only to connect middle mile in, uh, institutions, so-called anchor institutions like universities, hospitals, uh, governments and the like, but also to figure out how to get right to the edge. Obviously, a Case Western Reserve and, and one community are trying to engage and innovate in that space with, with one uh, block, the Hessler block, and now two more blocks under design. Um, and Russell and his colleagues at Google um, have uh, absolutely uh, sent off this moonshot of, of 50,000 to 500,000 homes being connected at gigabit speeds. And I'm hoping that that helps to frame it. I'm prepared, to, Tommy's here, to get a microphone to you. And we've got about 10 minutes or, or so for Q&A. Um, here's, your, here's your shot. Who's got the first question? Common. BJ over here, Tommy. Oh, I'm sorry. Good morning. No, it, it, the microphone traveled at the speed of fiber. <laughs> <laughs> Um, good morning. This is uh, it's a very it's just a fascinating. Uh, Vijay, just introduce yourself briefly uh, to the audience. I, Vijay Kumar from uh, MIT. I uh, lead the Office of Educational Innovation and Technology over there. Uh, it's it, I, I was struck by several things, and I won't comment on all of them. Uh, one of the things that I took from here, and why I find this whole initiative or these sets of initiative fascinating, is that it's actually looking at providing a network as a very large incubator. You know, and this reminds me of the early days. And Lev, you'll remember from uh, when NSFNet and, uh, you know, and, but they were really serving as incubators for research ideas. And whereas this uh, positions this incubator network as ideas for the community, which is really a fantastic way of looking at it. Uh, my, my question was, uh, you know, when you do these RFIs and you ask about expressions of interest from the community, uh, you know, sometimes I wonder if it's too much to assume that they would have figured out or imagined all the possibilities, you know, of, of uh, and if there's a role that your organizations have in helping communities imagining the possibilities, the way they can exploit uh, what's, you know, what the capacity that you're, that you're creating, that you're providing. Thanks, Vijay. We'll start with Russell and then we'll go to Scott. So, so I think you're right. I think, I think we do have, uh, um, well, I mean, like we talked about earlier, it, the fact that we're not delivering this as a free network, we're going to have to, uh, to prove the value to the end users, which means, I think, coming up with applications that can ride on the network that, that people actually want. Um, I think Scott will probably talk more about this, but he talked about the fact that uh, he's just as much in the demand generation business as he is in the, in the build out and the delivery of service business. Um, so I, I do believe that we'll have to come up with some applications uh, to sort of kickstart the network. But I do, I do also agree with your, your comment about it being an incubator for 
um, a broad uh, sort of for the for everybody to be able to develop great applications on. Um, and I think that's one of the great things about the internet as a whole, is that uh, you know uh, an 18 year old kid in, in a garage can create some great applications. Um, so I think that's that's also something that we expect to see and we hope to see. Well, there's lots of ways to approach us. I I would say that the that you mentioned the demand side. I, I think, again, the United States, unlike the, the more competitive countries, especially in digital infrastructure, I think our government leadership is not aware of the possibilities. I, so, I, so what I like about a Google piece is it does attract a lot of interest. So actually now the IT guys are allowed to talk to the mayor, <laughs> which is interesting and never happened. Um, it's, not a, it's not a financial or a budget discussion um, or an ROI discussion. Um, it, it is helping people s realize the societal benefits of digital infrastructure. So it helps change the conversation, and, and I'm pleased just to get the top, even if it's the top 1% of people that are interested and have the leadership. In the public sector in particular, in the United States, we don't have technologists often coming up and being politicians. At our, at our Fortune 500 businesses, you're seeing uh, actually our biggest employer here in the tech industry, Progressive, their CEO used to be the CIO. So that doesn't happen in the public sector here. So I think one of our challenges in the United States is that the, both at a policy level and when you've got communities, largely mayors and, uh, and other elected officials, trying to organize communities, it's very difficult without those, that vision, the understanding of the awareness. And nobody's out there really trying to do it. They're trying to do transactional, the vendors are investing in transactional business, not the demand side. So one of the things I would just add very briefly before we go to the next question is that uh, you know VJ from MIT, you know Lev representing Case Western Reserve University, um, I think uh, it, it, it behooves us to be part of that incubator space, and that's why I think our engineering faculty, our faculty from the School of Medicine, our faculty from the Social Work School, in fact, faculty from just about each part of the campus are either engaged or we hope to engage in actually figuring out how to create. Um, applica transformational applications, which may or may not have a business uh, uh, proposition, but will certainly have social value, uh, whether that's health, education, and, and the like, around which hopefully there'll be a model that provides both um, you know, opportunity for public play as well as for, for private uh, providers uh, to try to create a new model. Who's got the next question or, or comment for our panel? We've got about five minutes left in our, in our morning session. Please just introduce yourself for a second. Lisa Veronis, the University of Akron. Um, I'm thinking about a specific application for a rural community which is still on dial-up. What's the next step? So um, how do you go from chicken wire to uh, you know, an a, a ultra-broadband uh, superhighway? Uh, you know, what, what basically, uh, is there a leapfrogging strategy? Is that basically what's, what's likely to be happening at this point from your perspective, Russell? Um, I think I think this is an is an interesting problem that exists today. Um, I do think that that uh, that there will be a leapfrogging though. I think there are multiple ways of, of accessing rural areas. I think fiber is one of them. I think there are other access methods that are actually emerging as well. And wireless is another one that that, that could be an, uh, a viable alternative for rural areas. But um, but I do think that uh, there are, um, like Scott was talking about, sort of ways of, of funding a build out to rural areas. And I do think that it'll be, um, a fiber is probably the, the most economical way. I mean, if you're gonna be putting in the infrastructure in, in, in the sense that you probably wanna be putting in a fiber network rather than putting in a, a copper network. And so maybe you can sort of frame up your response, at least in part, uh, in terms of the um, current submission that you and the people in the state of Ohio put in for Middle Mile that includes a lot of rural connectivity. Sure, the, I guess my, my first reaction is, there's probably, uh, I think there's an opportunity for the community to help define what the business case is. So many times, like we had, this was like five, six years ago when I started to ask the same question, there were five actually big businesses and they couldn't get big broadband and it was because they each kept calling the cable company and it was the cable company looked at it as one, one transaction at a time. They didn't aggregate the five guys on the same street. So I think there's an opportunity to actually, as a community, come together, see what the interests are, aggregate those demands, and then almost like the RFI way, there's ways to, it's a much more interesting discussion when you've got a lot of people, a lot of consumers aggregated and asking, will you build to our area? In some cases, we actually have done countywide uh, business plans and strategies. So uh, we had a committed government, they actually just got bonds for 13, 14 million dollars in, in the next 30 days to do a countywide um, uh, deployment and it started with a question like that and over, it took us years, frankly, to do the business case, aggregate the demand, get commitments, 
and then uh, attract the resources to do it. And it's a county that's actually going to build and fund um, uh, the whole build out themselves. And then we'll open it up to other providers to bring it all the way to the consumer. But we'll start with actually all the public sector entities in a countywide piece. Great, great. Anyone have one last burning question? Otherwise, uh, we are at the end of time. Is there a burning question? If not, uh, please join me in thanking Russell and Scott for helping us kick off the morning. <laughs>